Specifically, the jumbled fossil remains of a Pleistocene mammoth, which earlier Greeks had found, rearranged, and reburied in a coffin some decades or even centuries before. When the remains were disinterred a second time, the ceremonial trappings were seen as proof that this was the grave of a legendary hero. The bones were carried with great ceremony to Sparta, which did indeed prosper, becoming the preeminent city-state in southern Greece. The Spartan announcement of their discovery of the bones of Orestes sparked a bone rush in Greece, and now every city wanted to have their own impressive bones of a local hero. It, it would be as if the bones of George Washington were lost, and then suddenly somebody found those bones and the relics of George Washington and other things about him and brought them back and deposited them in, say, the biggest city in our country. Well, there would be a, a psychological boost. Uh, uh, morale would be higher than it was before, especially because, unlike us, the Greeks endued their uh, heroes with a sense of semi-divinity. In her investigation of obscure ancient writings, folklorist Adrian Mayer found dozens of references to ancient searches and discoveries of giant bones. Some were reburied, but others, especially finds that consisted of a single bone, were brought to the local temple as a sacred offering. We have so many ancient accounts of ordinary people finding remarkable teeth, bones, tusks, and taking them to their temples and uh, various shrines that we know that there was, it was quite common for temples to have displays of fossils. One mystery remains. How did the Greeks, whose funeral rites and animal sacrifices must have made them familiar with human and animal anatomy, mistake ancient mastodons and mammoths for human remains? One way to investigate this question was to turn to a new science called taphonomy, a word that in Greek means principles of the grave. It's really the study of everything that happens to an animal after it dies and before it's discovered. So it can be how it came to rest, where you find it, how it was scavenged, if it was scavenged, and the type of preservation that allowed those bones to last for hundreds or thousands or millions of years. In the actual field, it's very complicated because it resembles more a crime scene where you've got parts of bodies laying around and little traces of footprints here and there, and you're going to try and piece together what happened, only you've come a million years after the crime was committed and you want to figure out what happened. Although the islands of the Aegean were rich with fossil remains, what would have survived in this earthquake-prone region? The chances of the ancients finding an intact skeleton were almost incalculable. Scientists have done a large variety of studies to try to figure out which bones are more likely to be preserved than others. The condition of a fossil depends heavily on what happens to the remains, how quickly they are buried, and how exposure to the elements or scavengers might affect them. The fossil record is very selective in what gets preserved. And this whole selection of what gets preserved is the science of taphonomy. It's a science which is young. It's only 50 years old, really, that the name was invented 50, 60 years ago. A scientist said, well, you know, there's a whole science here into how things, uh, what happens after death. By understanding how the bodies and skeletal systems break down, paleontologists can fill in the missing pieces and reconstruct how an animal might have looked in life. For mammals like us, the hardest parts of our bodies are our teeth. And for that reason, they're one of the most commonly fossilized elements. Long bones that are big tend to be the ones that get very well preserved. Small ones, like little fingers and claws, tend to get washed away very easily. The fossil itself is very fragile of something as seemingly brawny and beefy and huge as Tyrannosaurus are actually hollow, fragile, fragile things. And when the animal dies, it's composed of many bones. They're often taken apart. Um, many parts of the skull are nice items to chew on for some other animals, and so bones get destroyed that way, which is why you often find jaws. With only the long bones and teeth remaining from these giant mammals, the ancient Greeks would have been faced with seemingly familiar, if oversized, remains. 
A human leg bone in a lot of ways looks like a leg bone from any other mammal. Uh, they have the same basic shape. And so if you're somewhat familiar with what a human bone looks like, be that an arm bone or a leg bone, then it's not a real big jump to see a larger one and just think it's from a larger human rather than a different animal. The ancient historians estimated the height of their heroes to be two to three times the size of modern mortals, standing between 10 and 15 feet tall, a scale similar to the size of a mastodon's long bone when compared to a human specimen. If such remains were reassembled as a two-legged creature, the result would have been a huge, misshapen, but human giant. Such a reconstruction could easily account for the hundreds of references to heroes' bones, which seemed to confirm the ancient tales of titans, amazons, heroes, and giants. But if these tales all had a basis in reality, what could have inspired the Greeks' more monstrous and grotesque imaginings? Scattered across the Aegean are rich geological deposits from the Miocene and Pliocene epochs, a time when giant prehistoric mammals roamed the earth. Locked within these layers of sediment are the remains of mastodons and mammoths, the giant three-toed horses known as hipparions, and the short-necked samotherium. Constant seismic activity in the region has mingled the fossil remains and destroyed many of the most fragile and telling details. It could explain why so many of the mythological creatures envisioned by the Greeks are composites, part human, part animal. But no prehistoric mammal could ever be mistaken for one of the most fantastic and prevalent creatures of Greek mythology, the griffin. Described in dozens of ancient accounts, they were said to have the bodies of lions and the wings and beaks of raptors. Most often, they were depicted guarding gold, but in one instance, they kept vigil over the doom.